So let's get to our cash flows PowerPoints. And we're going to talk about financial versus accounting. Um, we kind of mentioned this a little bit in chapter one. Finance people and accounting people think differently. Uh, accounting people are all about matching expenses and revenues. Uh, finance people are all, all about the cash. And let's talk first, this is a finance concept, the cash flow from assets to investors. By the way, the investors are the stockholders and the bondholders. So CF parenthesis B means bondholders, CF parenthesis S means stockholders, and since those two groups of people basically own all the assets, they're the ones who get the cash flows from the assets. So that's where we get this formula. Okay, so uh, what is CFB? We also may call it cash flow to creditors. And of course, interest would be a cash flow to creditor because we're paying interest to people that loan us the money. Um, we are going to then subtract the change in long-term debt. Why are we doing that? Well, any more money that we borrow. So if ending long-term debt is greater than beginning long-term debt, then uh, it means we have borrowed additional money. That's actually cash flows from creditors, not cash flows to creditors. So that's why it's got a minus sign. Now, there was always going to be someone who argues, hey, wait a minute, why is it long-term debt instead of total debt? If you're interested, I have a mathematical proof of why that is and it's posted on Blackboard. And if you want to look at it, you're more than welcome to do so. But usually when the words mathematical proof leave my lips, the interest in contesting that issue goes away. And so we're not going to worry about that too much. Now we're going to talk about the cash flows to the shareholders. Remember that the company pays out dividends to the shareholders, so that would definitely be a cash flow to the shareholders. But just like with the debt, <laughs> we have to account for any new stock the company has issued. So we're gonna look at stock sold minus the stock that's been repurchased. Did you know that firms are allowed to buy their stock back? That's totally legal. Sometimes my students from China, they say, wait a minute, that's not legal in China, what well, is here? Okay, any questions? By the way, uh, on the exam, you're gonna be allowed a handwritten note sheet. What do you think should be on the note sheet? Formulas. Any formula that I cover in any video, lecture, anything like that, you should have on your formula sheet. Does that make sense? Okay. It's handwritten both sides. Write as small as you want, an understanding that you'll have to read it during the exam. No, you cannot type your note sheet. Okay. So here is our example, and I've got some uh, I've got some income statements and balance sheets here. So this is the next slide. So the cash flow bondholders we said was the interest minus the ending long-term debt minus the beginning long-term debt. Let's look at where to find those things. Where am I going to find interest? Is it going to be on the income statement or the balance sheet? Yeah, it's going to be on the income statement because it's an expense, right? And sure enough, there it is, interest expense 49. Then we also have to look at beginning and ending long-term debt. Where am I going to look for that? In income statement or balance sheet? Balance sheet. Yeah, on the balance sheet. And so we see there are current liabilities and there are long-term liabilities. So which one of those is going to be our long-term debt? Uh, there's one more long-term liability that I didn't tell you about, and it's called deferred taxes. And so your long-term liabilities are actually long-term debt and your deferred taxes. Where do deferred taxes come from? They come from the difference between uh, the way that the company accounts for its depreciation for their tax purposes and for their financial statement purposes. For some dumb reason, we use two different standards. The financial reporting standards say you can use straight line, and so that actually makes the company look uh, more profitable, but would increase the taxes if we use that. Uh, if we use accelerated depreciation, then it decreases our taxes, but it also makes us look less profitable. So companies want the best of both worlds. They want to report as if they have depreciated at straight line, 
but then uh, actually depreciate versus with the uh, accelerated depreciation in order to save on taxes. Now, in the end, they're going to pay exactly the same amount of taxes. They just have to pay them later. So since they're really not saving any tax dollars, why would they do that? Any ideas? They'd rather have that money than invest in whatever they want. Yeah, it's called the time value of money. I want to give those rascals at the IRS my money the latest possible date, right? So if you're doing your personal income tax, what do you do? You figure it on, say, March 1st, and if they owe you money, what do you immediately do? Send it in. You owe them money, what do you do? You wait till April 15th, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's uh, not anything you need to worry about in this class, but the other piece is something you need to worry about. And that is long-term debt. And the long-term debt here goes from 458 to 471. And so that change is going to be 13. And so 49 minus 13 is 36. What does that mean? The net cash that flowed to our bondholders was 36. And then we have the cash flow to the shareholders. And we've discussed the dividends or a cash flow to the shareholders. And then we've got our stock that was sold minus stock repurchase. This is where it gets kind of hairy. Uh, the first part's fairly easy. Where do I find the dividends? Yeah, on the income statements. Right down there, it's bottom 43. Bada bing, bada bing. We're in good shape. Now the problem, though, is finding stock purchased and or stock sold and stock purchased. And the problem comes with the way that this is put on the books. Now, of course, we're talking about common stock here, not preferred stock. But common stock actually shows up in two of these accounts. Does anyone have any idea what those two accounts are? Common stock and capital surplus. Oh, very good. Common stock and capital surplus. And so what happens is if we say, by the way, common stock has a stupid thing called par value. It's basically meaningless. But it leads to this problem. If we sell a single share of common stock for $15, $1 will go into the common stock account. The other 14, 15 minus 1, will go into the capital surplus account. Now, this used to be meaningful. Uh, I don't know. I have yet to have an accountant explain to me why it's still done today. But we do a lot of things because that's the way we've done it historically. For instance, did you know that the rails on railroads are spaced based on the size of a horse's rump? Why would that be? Because the first rail cars were pulled by. Yeah, isn't that dumb? Okay, now back to the story. So what does that mean? It means if I want to know the current amount of, uh, of money that's been raised by issuing common stock, I have to add capital surplus, plus the common stock. And so the amount of stock that would be outstanding at, uh, in 2014 here would be 347 plus 55. The amount that was available or was had been issued at the beginning of the year was 327 plus 32. And so <coughs> there we go. You see the 347 plus 55 and the 327 plus 32. So there you go. So that's your additional stock issue. And then we have to look at the stock that's been repurchased. How are we gonna know how much stock got repurchased? Any ideas? Oh, very good, less treasury stock. And you said you weren't an accountant. Uh, yeah, treasury stock, whenever we repurchase shares, that's where the money goes, is into that treasury stock account. And so uh, it went from 20 to 26 million during the year. What does that mean we spent repurchasing stock? Can you guys do 26 minus 20 in your heads? Six, very good, thank you. By the way, uh, here's why your math skills for doing math in your head are so rotten. In 1986, they made the decision that it would be perfectly fine to let kids use calculators in elementary school. Raise your hand if you used a calculator in elementary school. Yeah, most of you. That's why you're having trouble doing these things in your head. You know, we had to do it on the, you know, 
do it out by hand, right, or do it in the head. Okay, back to the story. Now, oh, wrong way. We can see that that is 43 minus 37 is the net new stock issued, and that gives us six. Now, here's a question. Would a company actually issue stock and repurchase stock in the same year? No, that would be stupid. By the way, issuing stock costs money because you have to pay uh, investment bankers underwriting costs to do so. And so instead of repurchasing the stock, we would just hold on to that and we would have only issued, say, 37 in new stock instead of 43. It's unfortunate that 43 shows up twice here. It's unfortunate that 6 shows up twice. Uh, okay, now, what are we getting around to? Well, we said that the money that was flowing to the bondholders and the shareholders came from the assets. And so when I add those things together, 36 and 6, I should come up with 42. That's how much money has been produced by the assets. Now, we are going to see that we have another way of figuring the cash flow from assets, and that's by actually looking at what the assets are producing. And you see that formula at the very top there? That's an important one. Cash flow from assets is equal to OCF. What's OCF? Very good. Operating cash flow. And uh, what is NCS? Very good. Net capital spending. And then minus, what does the little triangle mean? Yeah, it's delta. It means change, right? What is NWC? Oh, very good. Networking capital. Okay, so let's talk about net capital spending. It's ending net fixed assets minus beginning net fixed assets plus depreciation. Let's talk about why we have to add depreciation back. Keep in mind that between, between the two periods, there has been depreciation of how much? 90. And so that second figure is reduced by 90. Is depreciation a real cash flow? No, the accountants think so, but it's not. It's not a real cash flow. And so what we've got to do is we're going to have to reinflate that second number for net fixed assets by, by uh, 90. Okay, so now, oh, the wrong way. So our ending net fixed assets was 1,118, our <coughs> beginning was 1,035, and then we add 90, it gives us 173. Now what does that mean? It means that on net we have spent $173 on capital stuff. What does that mean? It mean, could mean that we had spent $200 million on new equipment and that we sold equipment for $27 million. That would bring us to $173. And typically in a year, you're going to see companies both buying and selling, both buying and selling their capital assets. So let's give an example. How many of you have ever traded in a used car? Yeah, when you traded that car in, you had the amount of money you were going to pay for the newer one, right? And then they gave you credit for the lesser one. The amount of money she actually wrote the check for was her net capital spending. Does that make sense? By the way, uh, machines, there's a, there's a used machine market just like there's a used car market. And so used machines, used buildings, things like that, we can certainly sell them and get money out of them. Okay, now let's talk about the change in networking capital. It's, of course, the ending networking capital minus the beginning networking capital. Can anyone tell me the formula for networking capital? Oh, man, we're in trouble. Very good. He's on fire. Current assets minus current liabilities. And so what we've got to do is look back at our balance sheet, because that's where current assets and current liabilities are. And we can see that our current assets at the end of 2014 were 761, 
and the current liabilities for 486, 761 minus 486 gives us our current or our networking capital for 2014. We do similarly for 2013, we just take 707 minus 455. And that's how we get our change in networking capital of 23. Now it makes sense to us why net capital spending is money out. What makes less sense to people is why change in networking capital going up is money out. Let's think here is cash out. Let's think about what current assets are. Can anyone name a current asset other than cash? I'll give you a hint, one starts with an I. Inventory. If I go out and spend four million dollars to put inventory on the shelf, what happens to my inventory amount? It goes up by four million dollars. That means my current assets go up by four million dollars. That means my networking capital has gone up by four million dollars. But what's happened to my cash? Yeah, it's gone down by four million dollars because I had to put that stuff, I had to pay to get that stuff on the shelf. Let's think about another one. Accounts receivable. Accounts receivable, uh, you've, you've sold the stuff, but have you received any cash for it yet? No. And so as accounts receivable goes up, it's like you're lending money to people. When you loan money to a friend, is that cash outflow or cash inflow? Outflow. So as accounts receivable goes up, current assets go up, and as a result, network capital goes up, cash goes down, right? Now let's talk about current liabilities. What about accounts payable? Accounts payable is like someone loaning you money. And so if someone loans you money, what does that do to your cash? It goes up. And so what we'll see is as current liabilities, as accounts payable goes up, networking capital goes down, cash goes up. And so don't freak yourself out trying to remember how these things actually work. Just sit there and think, okay, uh, the, the ones that you know, inventory, it's a current asset. If it goes up, it means I spent some cash. Cash must go down. Does that make sense? And then know that liabilities always just work in the opposite direction. Okay, let's see. Then we've got operating cash flow. Not to be confused with cash flow from operations because that is a, an accounting thing. Cash flow from operations is an accounting thing. And it's EBIT. What's EBIT? What does that stand for? Earnings before interest and taxes. Very good. Earnings before interest and taxes. And depending on where you're at, it's either EBIT or EBIT. And whichever one I say, people always correct me the other way. So I always just say EBIT. And then they're flustered because they were looking forward to correcting me. Okay. Now, depreciation. Where am I going to find, well, we'll get to EBIT here in a minute. Where am I going to find depreciation? Yeah, the income statement. Where am I going to find taxes? On the income statement, right? Not deferred taxes. That's on the balance sheet. Yeah, we're going to send, find taxes on the, on the income statement. And we're going to come up with EBIT from the income statement as well. In fact, let's look at that income statement. So we've got 219 of EBIT. You may also, uh, so, no, I won't say that. Um, so earnings before interest in taxes. Why are we, by the way, we're doing operational stuff here. And this is one of the big arguments between finance people and accounting people. Accounting people think interest is a cost of operations. Finance people will tell you it is a cost of financing because if we don't have any financing, we don't have any interest, and it's not anything to do with the operations whatsoever. Now, the, why, the reason that accountants want to put this into the income statement is because we have to subtract that interest before we calculate our taxes, and that's part of that. But I can prove to you that interest isn't truly part of operations because where are dividends? Dividends aren't in this thing anywhere, right? They're down at the bottom just kind of an afterthought. Dividends are also a cost of financing, but that's not, we don't include them with operations. Okay, so we are looking at earnings before interest and taxes, and then we're adding back depreciation. Why are we adding back depreciation? 
Keep in mind, we're looking for cash flow. Why are we adding back depreciation? Yes. It's not a cash flow. It is a non-cash expense. Your big non-cash expenses are um, the depreciation. And then you'll see that deferred taxes down there of 13. That's also a non-cash expense. So we're going to have to add things like that back. OK, so that's why we're adding depreciation back. OK. So we have an EBIT of, or EBIT of 219. We remember that our depreciation was 90, and we are subtracting 71 in taxes. Now, this is another thing to notice. We are only subtracting the current portion of taxes. We are not subtracting total taxes. We are only subtracting the current portion of taxes. We are not subtracting total taxes. Any idea why? What did I just get through saying about depreciation and deferred taxes? They are both non-cash expenses. We're trying to figure out cash here. And so that's why we are only concerned about the current portion of taxes. Are we eventually going to have to pay that other 13? Yes. Will we have to do that by the end of this period? Absolutely not. OK. Now I do all that. Whoa, wrong way. Um, I get my cash flow from assets to be operating cash flow minus net working capital or minus net capital spending minus the change in net working capital gives me 42, which is precisely what we found. We found the cash flow to bondholders and the cash flow to shareholders. And so we've got these assets over here that are producing money, and then we're turning around and sending that to the investors. And so this last slide that we went over is all about figuring out the money that's coming from the assets. And then the other, the previous one that we looked at, is all about figuring out the money that is going to these folks. If they don't match, is that OK? No. They've got to match, or you're in a world of hurt. You need to go back and check your math. Most common mistake using total taxes instead of current taxes. The most common mistake is using total taxes instead of current taxes. Also, using total debt instead of long-term debt. Using total debt instead of long-term debt. Those are the two most common mistakes. And by the way, on multiple choice questions, do you think that I might include that most common mistake number as one of the choices? Yeah, because I'm that mean. And so what does that mean? It means you have to actually know what you're doing in order to make sure that you're going to get this right. So in other words, just saying your answer there doesn't necessarily mean you are correct. So now, well, so we've talked about how financing people look at cash flow. Let's talk about how accounting people talk about cash flow. Accountants are smart. They know that the income statement does not actually uh, reflect cash flow. So what do they do? Well, to fix the problem, they come up with an entirely new statement called the Statement of Cash Flows. And it's got three sections. It's got an operating section, it's got an investing section, and it's got a financing section. And as we mentioned before, the major difference in, is with finance is that interest expense. Accountants want to include it with that operating section, and finance people would rightly say that it should be part of <laughs> financing. Okay, so down here, uh, let's talk about this indirect method. We could actually just use all the transactions of the firm and list all of them out, pluses and minuses, cash is flowing in and out, and come up with this statement of cash flows. But that would be a huge amount of effort, and the statement of cash flows would be extraordinarily long. And so what accountants tend to do is they start with net income and then make, a, 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 what's it called, adjustments for the non-cash type stuff that's going on there. And that's called the indirect method. And I have never seen anything other than the indirect method used to create a statement of cash flows. Okay, so over here on the left-hand side, we have our statement of cash flows. And notice it starts with net income. By the way, where did that net income come from? Where did they get it? Which statement came with? Oh, this is an easy question. 
Yeah, it comes from the income statement, right? We pulled it directly from the income statement. And then we're going to add back depreciation. Why do we have to add back depreciation? Yeah, it's a non-cash expense. And then we've got to add back our deferred taxes. Remember, when they did net income, they subtracted out that entire 84. That's not right, because 13 of that was not cash. So we have to add that back. And so that takes care of the easy stuff. And now we've got to look at our changes in current assets and liabilities. And the first one we'll look at is uh, accounts receivable. What is accounts receivable? Where does it come from? Say again? Oh, okay. So it does come from the balance sheet. But how do accounts receivable get created in the real world? When I sell something and I don't get what? Yeah, I don't get cash. So I'm extending credit. That's where accounts receivable will come from. And so as I'm extending credit to people, as that accounts receivable goes up, my cash goes down. Does that make sense? I'm loaning money out to people. And so what we see here is they've got uh, accounts receivable minus 24. They mean that our cash has gone down by 24 as a result of the change in accounts receivable. That means accounts receivable must have gone up by 24. How do we check that? Well, we go to our balance sheet and we look for accounts receivable and we see that it went from 270 to 294. Did it go up by 24? Yeah, absolutely. And so we're going to see a pattern here that any of the current assets that go up, cash goes down. But the current liabilities that go up, cash goes up. So assets and or assets and cash move in the opposite direction. Liabilities and cash move in the same direction. Okay, next we have inventories. Uh, inventory produced 11 in cash. Does that mean my inventory was up or down? Yeah, it had to be down because when we sell inventory, it brings in cash. When we buy inventory, cash goes out. Does that make sense? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go look at inventories. And sure enough, it went from 280 to 269, which is a drop of 11. Okay, then there is accounts payable. Is accounts payable a current liability or a current asset? Yeah, it's a liability, and we know that liabilities run in the same direction as cash. And since this is positive 31, we're assuming that the accounts payable went up by 31. Take a look at the balance sheet. Accounts payable went from 455 up to 486. That's a gain of how much? 31, right? Okay, whew, finally, we can add all that stuff together and come up with our total cash flow from operations. It's 207. Now we've got investing activities. Investing activities is when we go out and purchase new assets or when we sell old assets. And so we can see here that we have our acquisition of fixed assets and our sale of fixed assets. I believe that comes from that was from a footnote. That was from a footnote on the balance sheet. But even if we didn't have that, we could actually go look at our, this is exactly the same as net capital spending. Do you recognize that the number's the same? Exactly the same as net capital spending. Only in this case, because it's looking at cash flows, the number is negative, not positive. Remember in our operating cash flow or our uh, cash flow from assets formula, we had a negative in front of an NCS. Question so far. If this number is negative, it means I've bought more equipment than I sold. If this number is positive, it means I've sold more equipment than I've bought. Does that make sense? Okay. And then we have our financing activities. And the first one we see there is retirement of long-term debt. <laughs> what does it mean when you retire debt? Is the debt taken off to Florida, sitting on the beach? Say again? 
Yeah, when we pay off debt, we are retiring the debt. So that means we paid off uh, net 73. But the question is, uh, is that is that really the case that we've done just, just uh, I'm sorry. No, I need to leave that one alone for now. I'll talk after the, after the next one. Then we've got proceeds from long debt, long-term debt sales. So we sold 86 million in new debt, and we paid off 73 million in old debt. Why didn't we just borrow 13 million more? Any ideas? How many of you have ever borrowed money for a car? Okay, so that would be one of the deals, would be refinancing of the debt. If you have a chance to issue some new bonds at a lower interest rate, and you could pay off old bonds, wouldn't that be great? And in fact, that's what I've done with my house several times, is <laughs> borrowed new money at a lower interest rate to pay off the old money at higher interest rates. That's one reason. What's the other one? What happens to the debt? Do people just let, let that ride forever, unless it's a personal loan to you from a friend? No. Eventually, you're going to have to pay that off, right? And so debt matures. Debt matures. It must be paid off. The most common thing we do in American business is not to save up our money and pay off all the debt. No. What do we do? We borrow new money to pay off old. By the way, it's exactly the same thing that our government does, right? You guys are thinking, oh, I'm paying, paying my taxes, paying down that national debt. It's all good. Wrong. We just keep borrowing more and more money and using that new money to pay off old money. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's why we would go out and borrow 86 and pay off 73. Let's see. Then we have uh, dividends, minus 43. Why would dividends have a minus in front of it here? Any ideas? Is that cash in or out? Yeah, the cash is going out. It's leaving the company. And then we have the repurchase of stock. We, we said earlier we repurchased six million. What do we have to use to buy that stock? Six million in cash, right? And so then uh, we we also issued forty three in new stock, which means that we had forty three million flow in from issuing that stock. So that's cash inflow, and so we can add all of that together and come up with the total cash flow from financing activities of seven. And so now all I have to do is add 207, subtract 173, and add seven, and hopefully I would come up with 41. And that's the change in cash. Now how can I verify that that number is correct? Where would I look to see what the change in cash was? Which statement? Where does cash show up? Balance sheet. Yeah, it shows up on the balance sheet under the current assets. And so what we should see here is that the cash went up by 41. What's 198 minus 157? It's 41. And so all these things link together. They all link together. All three statements do. Any questions so far? Okay, would you like to know how to spot a sick firm? I think it's a good idea. So operating cash flow, by the way, you could be have positive change in cash at the bottom and still be a sick firm. Let's talk about how you do that. Uh, your operating cash flow would probably be negative, but you are selling enough assets and borrowing enough money and selling enough stock that the positive financing and investing cash flows outweigh that negative operating cash flow. I'll give you an example. Are you guys familiar with um, J.C. Penney? Actually, let's go with Sears. Sears is even worse. <laughs> so Sears used to be the, like the big thing. When I was a kid, we'd get to Sears, the Christmas, so there was the big Cadillac log that mom cared about, and then there was the Christmas catalog that I cared about. It was about that big. That was back when we used paper. Anyway, and uh, that, that was like a, a major retailer. But over time, they lost touch with the times, they didn't invest in themselves, and then it turned into basically a squalid hellhole 
that you might be familiar with as of recently. Now, here's what happened at Sears. Their operating cash flows started to go down, 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 down. But the way they kept things going was that the uh, CEO and majority owner, a guy named Eddie Lampert, kept pushing money into the firm. So that would have been positive cash flow from financing. And they also started selling their assets. An example, Craftsman Tools. They actually sold the Craftsman brand. I think they sold Kenmore too. Those were two, two important pieces of, uh, what's it called, intellectual property that they had. And they used that money then to try to keep going a little longer. What's the question? So Sears owned the Craftsman brand? Oh yeah, Sears developed the Craftsman brand. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, so Sears actually had a lot of things in it. Real estate, all sorts of other things, and they're basically like selling all their assets. And so this is like you losing your job, and then you're like, you, you go to your mom, and you say, hey mom, can I borrow some money? Positive cash flow from financing. And then you, you go to your friend, and you say, hey dude, can I borrow some money? He's like, no way man, last time you welched. No way. He say, would you like to buy my motorcycle? He says, yeah, I'll buy your motorcycle if the price is right. By the way, do you think you get really good prices when you're fire sailing your assets like this? No. Because people, if I know you're a motivated seller, am I going to offer you a great price up front? No. And so this is what happened at Sears. And so there you go. That's how you spot these, uh, these bad firms is if they've got a positive, well, first of all, if they've got a negative change of cash, then investigate them thoroughly. But if they're positive, look further. If that positive is coming from in investing, financing, or both, then you've got a problem firm. I would stay away from it. Questions?